the elementary wave solution to the central mystery of quantum mechanics. In the spring of 2018, I presented a new idea to the American Physical Society in Boston. What I presented is the elementary wave solution to the central mystery of quantum mechanics. Nobel laureate Richard Feynman had said that the double slit experiment embodies the central weirdness of quantum mechanics and he said no one using quantum mechanics can understand that mystery but we have a different approach called the elementary wave model which allows us to understand and explain this central mystery as you will see. The American Physical Society is the top scholarly society of physicists in the United States and in the world. And let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have a mathematics degree from Brown University. I have advanced degrees from Harvard University, Yale University, Case Western Reserve University, and for many years I was on the faculty of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. The model I'm about to present is very similar to, but in some fundamental ways, in a simple way, different from quantum theory. Quantum theory is based on the idea that waves and particles go in the same direction. This is based on the idea that they go in opposite directions. Particles follow waves backwards. The elementary wave approach is not mathematically superior to, nor really different from, the quantum approach. But it does allow us to solve that problem called the central mystery, and also to solve many other problems such as the mysteries of wave function collapse. The easiest way to get started is to discuss an experiment that was published in 1992 by Kaiser et al. A neutron interferometer experiment. They took a neutron source up here, in this case a nuclear reactor, and the neutrons came down this blue line here into an interferometer where they split into two streams and then recombined and left the interferometer and are detected down here by a detector. Now right here where the waves split into psi 1 and psi 2, there is an aluminum plate oscillating backwards and forwards so that the phase of psi 1 is different than the phase of psi 2. And when they are recombined down here in the final plate to leave the interferometer, there's interference. So what the detector sees is sine wave, an interference pattern. Bismuth is a metal that slows down neutrons and neutron waves, and so they put a sample of bismuth into the upper pathway so that the upper wave packet is slowed down relative to the lower wave packet, and when they are recombined down here in the, in the final part of the interferometer and leave, if they put in no bismuth, you get a lot of oscillation in the final signal. If they put in five millimeters of bismuth, the upper wave packet and lower wave packet don't quite overlap, and therefore there's a muted amount of interference. If they put in 10 to 20 millimeters of bismuth in the upper pathway, all interference is destroyed and you just get a flat line. That's shown here in this illustration, uh, showing at the top the strong interference, the medium interference with 5 millimeters of bismuth, and no interference with 10 to 20, uh, a flat line. Now they repeated exactly the same experiment with one tiny exception. Just one exception. Down here in front of the detector, they put an analyzer crystal made of pressed silicon. Now the nature of this analyzer crystal is to reduce the scatter of the neutron beam and increase the penetration, the, the intensity of the beam in the center. So the beam should have more penetration, but that should not have any influence on the interference that took place previously inside the interferometer upstream, should it? To everyone's astonishment, inserting that analyzer crystal down there, outside the interferometer downstream, restored robust interference upstream inside the interferometer, which made no sense. They couldn't explain it. They said quantum mechanics cannot explain this 
because the waves and particles are going in the same direction. However, in our elementary wave model, we can easily explain it. We would say that if the presence or absence of an analyzer crystal down here it profoundly influences and creates interference upstream inside the interferometer, then the analyzer crystal must be upstream from the interference. So the waves are going this way up into the nuclear reactor and from time to time a neutron is following them backwards and uh, that explains the data, that explains the entire experiment. This is not the way we normally think about things at all. It's very hard to comprehend if you've been trained in physics and science. It's the opposite of what you would expect and yet, there it is. We have zero energy waves going in one direction and the energy following the waves backwards. The waves going in this direction carry a probability current or flux which is moving, which points in the opposite direction as the direction of the waves. Now, how could it be? that just when you need a wave of a certain wavelength going in a certain direction, like that, one happens to be available. Well, this neutron interferometer experiment implies that everywhere in nature, at all points, there are elementary waves of zero energy traveling in all directions at all wavelengths. That just seems to be the implied world we live in. Well, if that were true, I mean, why would a neutron follow a wave like that? Well, the implication is that no particle of any kind can move at all, ever, without following a wave. There's always a wave particle. The particle has to be following one wave or the other. Why would a particle like a neutron follow a zero energy wave? Well, you know, there are two kinds of waves in physics. There are waves that carry energy, like ocean waves and electromagnetic waves, and then there are the waves that carry probability amplitudes, but not energy. It appears that in the neutron interferometer experiment, we have a wave going in this direction, carrying with it probability amplitudes that have a current, a probability current, pointing in the opposite direction. The implication is also that a neutron will only follow a wave which has the same wavelength as the amount of energy in the neutron. The neutron carries all the energy and momentum, uh, everything interesting. Uh, the wave carries no energy. I mean, I hate to mention it. We live, apparently, in an ocean of elementary wave interference that we know nothing about, that doesn't interact with us, except insofar as we observe the movement of particles following those waves backwards. Now let's take what we just learned and apply it to the double slit experiment. The top part of this illustration shows the double slit experiment as, as understood by quantum mechanics, with an electron gun on the left, a barrier screen with two slits in the middle, and a target screen on the right. At point X, you would see part of the pattern. The elementary wave model is shown below that, which is just exactly the opposite. The waves start at the target screen, go through the two slits. Now, if X is at the center of the target screen, then the elementary waves, when they go through the two slits, uh, are in phase and there's constructive interference over here, a lot of amplitude, and therefore a higher probability that an electron will be triggered by those waves to follow the waves backwards. If probabilistically an electron is triggered, is fired in response to those impinging waves, it will follow that one wave backwards with a probability of one it doesn't matter which slit is used and hit the target screen at exactly that point from which its wave is coming. If on the other hand X on the target screen is slightly lower uh, than the center of the screen then there's more distance from X to the upper slit than to the lower slit 
So they're out of phase as they go through and there is destructive interference in proximity to the electron gun. You see all of the interference in elementary wave theory is in proximity uh, to the electron gun. None of it is near in proximity to the screen. And because of the destructive interference, there's flat water, no probability of an electron being fired, and therefore that point X on the target screen will remain black. So this mechanism that I'm describing reproduces on the target screen the wave pattern that you see with the quantum mechanics way of thinking. And furthermore, the mathematics is exactly the same in our explanation as in the quantum mechanics explanation. In our explanation, the amplitude of the elementary waves impinging on the electron gun is A plus B. These are complex numbers referring to the amplitude of the wave coming through slit A or slit B. To find the probability of an electron being fired and therefore a dot appearing on the target screen, it is proportional to A plus B squared. And because those are complex numbers, that are added and squared, that's where you get all this quantum interference. So this slide here shows on the top part of the slide the probability of a point X appearing on the target screen according to quantum mechanics, and the lower part of the screen with exactly the same mathematics shows the probability of a particle hitting the target screen at point X according to elementary wave theory. Now you might say, if both theories produce the same mathematics, who cares? I mean, it's the mathematics that's so important. But there's a big difference between these two models of the double slit experiment. When does wave function collapse occur? In our model, wave function collapse occurs when an electron is fired. By the time the electron is fired, all the probabilistic effects have taken place, and after that, the, the electron simply follows a known trajectory, namely the trajectory of the wave backwards to the target screen. On the other hand, in the quantum mechanics approach, as you know, wave function collapse occurs just as the electron hits the target screen, and that has caused all kinds of confusion in the quantum mechanics model. Schrodinger's cat, for example. So which is more realistic, saying that wave function collapse occurs when a particle is fired, or wave function collapse occurs at the, at the target screen? Well, let's, let's look at it. Supposing I stand here with a pistol, and I shoot the pistol, and a dot appears over here on the target screen. Now, in the real world, the world you and I know, would you say that all the probabilities for that bullet collapse into one definite reality when it hits the target screen, when a dot appears on the target? Or would you say that all the different probabilities collapse into one reality when the bullet is fired? Well, obviously, it's when the bullet is fired, and therefore elementary wave theory comes closer to the world we know than does the quantum picture. So now we talk about complementarity. We're going to put a detector inside the double slit experiment. That's this eyeball. Now the eyeball doesn't just sit there. It has to be putting out a small amount of energy. And that energy, although small, has a profound effect on the zero energy elementary wave trying to get backwards through that slit. As you can see, the lower elementary wave in red goes right through the lower slit, but the upper elementary ray changes from red to blue, meaning that it has changed in its nature. And what is the nature of that change? It is that it is no longer capable of causing interference in combination with a lower wave. It's like an independent wave. It no longer knows its mate. They're not related to each other any longer. That's why one is red and one is blue. It is similar to a marriage in which a couple are harmonious and get along well and do everything together until the day when one of them is unfaithful and is seen naked by a detector and after that there's no further trust or communication. They're like two independent people, no longer a partnership no longer able to relate to each other, no longer able to cause interference in proximity to the electron gun. 
I want to make it clear that I have not been speaking about my own marriage. Maureen and I get along very harmoniously. There is no estrangement. What there is, is interference, which is sometimes constructive and sometimes destructive, but we're always relating to each other. Now you're probably asking yourself, well, what about the wave-particle duality experiments? Doesn't that prove wave-particle duality? Well, here's the first and most famous of those experiments by Davis and, and Germer. As you can see, they fired electrons down from a gun onto a nickel crystal, and the electrons came off the crystal at various angles, which are found by a voltmeter over here. And so the red lines on these graphs shows the results of the voltage and position of the electrons coming off the crystal. Now the most famous of these results is this one here. At 54 volts, they found a spur in the data, which is not how electrons would normally bounce off a crystal. This spur can only be explained if the electrons are interacting with waves of 1.67 angstrom wavelength. And uh, that's why there's all this attention on the spur in the Davis and Germer experiment. And everybody said, well, that proves wave-particle duality. That spur proves it. But look at that spur. Do you see any evidence there that the waves and particles are going in the same direction? No, you can't tell which way the waves are going relative to the particles. And that's true of all the wave-particle duality experiments that have been done since then. They simply ignore the question whether the waves and particles are going in opposite directions. Richard Feynman said that nobody can understand the universe as portrayed by quantum mechanics. And what do we mean by the universe of quantum mechanics? Well, it includes everything you see here, all of me, all the world, everything physical. That is the universe of quantum mechanics. And I think it's a bit of a problem if quantum experts can't understand it. Feynman said that the central mystery of this quantum world is portrayed in the double slit experiment and he said no one could understand that, but as you have seen, we have been able to understand that and describe it in a sensible way using logic and common sense and the elementary wave assumptions. So thank you very much for your attention.